next story we have, we're going to be talking about the end of the world, baby. So, MIT predicted in 1972 that society will collapse in the next hundred years. New research shows that we are right on schedule. Not, not to alarm anyone, not to make uh, anyone uh, fret, but I think that this piece of research really highlights why we need to dismantle capitalism, why capitalism cannot be the answer to the problems we are facing today, and uh, why we need to embrace socialism and left-wing values if we hope to survive as a species. Um, those are some pretty bold claims, uh, but let's go into the research. So, in a 1972 MIT study predicted that rapid economic growth would lead to societal collapse in the mid-21st century. A new paper shows we're unfortunately right on schedule. Uh, what do you think about a revolution given the climate change and other time constraints on us? Link himself, that entirely depends upon the feasibility of a revolution. I don't think a revolution in the sense that you are talking about is at all feasible in our current material conditions. Um, do I have a link to share? Here. Depressing topic? I know. So, a remarkable new study by a director at one of the largest accounting firms in the world has found that a famous, decades-old warning from MIT about the risk of industrial civilization collapsing appears to be accurate based on new empirical data. At the world, as the world looks forward to a rebound in economic growth following the devastation wrought by the pandemic, the research rise, uh, raises urgent questions about the risks of attempting to simply return to the pre-pandemic normal. In 1972, a team of MIT, MIT scientists got together to study the risks of societal collapse. Their system dynamics model, published by the Club of Rome, identified impending limits of growth that meant industrial civilization was on track to collapse sometime within the 21st century due to overexploitation of planetary, planetary resources. So, unfortunately, capitalism relies on constant growth. And the the, the unfortunate reality is that we live in a world that doesn't support constant growth because we have a finite number of resources. Um, so when, they, when they're talking about this limits to growth, what does that actually mean to uh, researchers, right? Um, so the study was the study uh, that confirmed this was published in the Yale Journal of Industrial Ecology in November 2020 and is available here. Check it out for free. There we go. It concludes that the current business as usual trajectory of global civilization is heading toward the terminal decline of economic growth. Uh, within the coming decade, and at worst could trigger societal collapse by around 2040. Um, the study represents the first time a top analyst working within a mainstream global corporate entity has taken the limit to growth model seriously. Um, let's see. Let's see. Given the unappealing uh, prospect of collapse, I was curious to see which scenarios were aligning most closely with empirical data today. After all, the book that featured this world model was a bestseller in the 70s, and by now we'd have several decades of empirical data, which would make up a compare which which would make a comparison meaningful. But to my surprise, I could not find recent attempts for this, so I decided to do it myself. Let's see. Uh, she found that the latest data most closely aligns with two particular scenarios, BAU2, business as, u as usual, and CT, comprehensive technology. So, BAU2 and CT scenarios show a halt in growth within a decade or so from now, the study concludes. Both scenarios thus include, indicate that continuing business as usual, that is, pursuing continuous growth, is not possible. 
Even when paired with unprecedented technological development and adoption, business as usual, as modeled by limit to, gro uh, limit to growth, would inevitably lead to declines in industrial capital, agricultural output, and welfare levels within this century. Study author Gaia Harrington told Motherboard that the in the MIT World 3 models, collapse does not mean that humanity will cease to exist, but rather that economic and industrial growth will stop and then decline, which will hurt food production and standards of living. In terms of timing, the BAU2 scenario shows a steep decline uh, set, uh, to set in around 2040. So uh, this map, uh, the, these maps kind of show the general trends here. So we're around like right here-ish or rather right here, I guess. Um, so industrial output uh, continues to go up and then suddenly goes down. Can capitalism survive a robotic industrial revolution? Uh, yes, the passing void. Unfortunately, uh, robotic industrialization will not uh, will not keep uh, the working class alive and will likely be why capitalists and conservatives would uh, turn to uh, prospects like a uh, universal basic income. But that income won't be to help people. It will be essentially the bread and circuses of ancient Rome, paying people uh, to not engage in revolutionary activities. Hello, Big Ben. Uh, then we have uh, the CT, which uh, I believe uh, re uh, revolves around like inventing crazy new technologies, um, where the decline is much less steep um, and is overall not as bad. Uh, but it would st it would see us kind of leveling out. In the comprehensive technology scenario, economic decline still sets in around the date within a range of possible negative consequences, but this does not lead to societal collapse. Unfortunately, the scenario which was least close to, uh, closest fit to the latest empirical data happens to be the most optimistic pathway uh, known as SW, stabilized world, in which civilization follows a sustainable path and experiences the smallest declines in economic growth based on a combination of technological innovation and widespread investment in public health and education. So this is best case scenario, which we do not seem to be on track to hit, um, which is very unfortunate for us. We're all gonna die. No, you're not all gonna die. Settle down. Even in guys, even in the worst case scenario, what they mean by uh, like when okay, when these when these companies and analysts say like societal collapse will happen, they don't mean we're all gonna die. They don't mean that like everyone's gonna be blasted back into the dark ages. They don't mean it's gonna be Mad Max. What they mean is that it's going to be harder. It's going to be kind of like the Great Depression, but like for a longer period of time uh, because the capitalist class can't earn as much money doing the same things it used to. Yeah, no no Mad Max BL Braga. Um, maybe if it gets bad enough on Australia. While focusing on the pursuit of continued economic growth for its own sake will be futile, the study finds that technological progress and increased investments in public services could not just avoid the risk of collapse, but lead to a new, stable, and prosperous civilization operating safely within planetary boundaries. But we really have only the next decade to change course. At this point, therefore, the data most aligns with CT and BAU2 scenarios, which indicate a slowdown and eventual halt in growth within the next decade or so. But world three leaves open whether the subsequent de decline will con constitute a collapse, the study concludes. Although the stabilized world scenario tracks least closely a deliberate trajectory change brought about by society turning toward another goal, then growth is still possible. The limit to growth uh, work implies that this window of opportunity is closing fast. So um, basically 
we have a window of opportunity to put our world on course for a, a, a long-term stabilized project that will minimize the amount of suffering that uh, economic collapse will entail. However, um, if we don't meet that window, there are still things that we can do to minimize uh, the damage to our economies, to our education systems, to our planet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so essentially, again, th this is one of the things I hope that you guys take away from my channel, right? It's that while we do want to have goals, like, hey, let's get on track with a revolutionary Green New Deal uh, within the next decade, okay? Let's, let's push politically for that as if our lives depended on it, you know? But even if we don't make it 100%, any little step in the direction of improving things is going to make things less bad down the line. So even if we don't fully make it, if we, if we just make it 80% within the next uh, 10 years, that doesn't mean we failed. It just means that we, we're going to have to work harder to avoid a uh, catastrophe going forward into the future, you know? What are we pushing that our lives depend on? Uh, for sustainable growth, for ecological uh, preservation, for uh, investment into our civilian infrastructure, things like that. That's what we need to push for. These are the things that uh, like show how we can avoid the worst case scenario shown in these models. Um, it, it literally investing in education, getting people healthcare, getting people housing, getting people on board with sustainable development. These are things that we can do that are going to improve society in the short term, but in the long term also help us to avoid the worst case scenarios uh, being indicated in these economic models. But you see the peeps pushing this, supporting Nancy Pelosi eventually. So we should just hate them and give up. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah. That, that's the thing. If somebody, if somebody's working with us on something, um, or, uh, you know, giving public, uh, support towards something that means, uh, and we don't like them. That means we should just not, uh, push for it. You know, like <laughs> we need to, we need to, we need to take every win we can get no matter where we can get it. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Harrington argued for an a growth and agnostic approach to growth, which focuses on other economic goals and priorities. Changing our societal priorities hardly needs to be a capitulation to grim necessity, she said. Human activity can be regenerative and our productive capacities can be transformed. In fact, we are seeing examples of that happening right now. Expanding those efforts now creates a world full of opportunity that is also sustainable. If you're with us, the most important thing is they tell us we're wonderful and boo Democrats at all times. Also, make sure you lash out at every other leftist who even vaguely gestures uh, in criticism of you. Um, you said something that wasn't 100% positive about me? Fuck you. Everyone attack. You know, that that's basically where we're at. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that this is actually somewhat hopeful, right? Like, we aren't on a planet that is uh, being depleted of, like, these resources that we'll never be able to get back. There are things we can do to regenerate and regrow our planet. There are things that we can do to heal the wounds we've created. And that's, in fact, what we must do if we want to have a long-term, sustainable planet to give our children but also a long-term sustainable civilization to give our children will there be weed in the future yep lots of weed um the uh the writer of this paper harrington uh she also noted how the rapid development and deployment of vaccines um kind of indicates just how much when we re realign our priorities we can actually achieve things which is pretty you know that that's pretty that's pretty accurate 
like guys we we like rebuilt europe in like the uh the, the course of what like 10 years less than 10 years um we can do things we can do hard things we can invest in infrastructure we can build mega projects And I think that's really quite, um, quite remarkable. The human capacity for um, making sure that we can continue on this planet. Um, here is actually a really interesting video about one of the things that we could do going forward to change how we go about doing things that we currently do, but just change it up a little bit, and we'd actually have a much healthier planet overall. So uh, this was actually really eye-opening to me. I found this earlier today, um, and it's about how concrete creates about as much CO2 um, as uh, as its own mass. So it's like a one-to-one -one ratio due to the process of making concrete. Uh, so let's uh, let's learn a little bit about uh, the most boring uh, the most boring thing we could possibly learn about uh, concrete. Uh, the next closest thing to watching paint dry. Earth's climate is changing rapidly. The world is heating up. These are undeniable facts, and the culprit for this very recent, very rapid change is us. With the help of fossil fuels, humans emit billions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere concrete. every All my homies year. Hate when you think of carbon emissions, you probably imagine the cars on the road, the power running from your apartment, or even the electricity in the light bulbs above your head. If we look at the breakdown of the 51 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases we emit every year, however, electricity <laughs> only accounts for 27% of the problem. It's not even the biggest sector in terms of emissions. That award goes to the oft forgotten manufacturing sector. Emissions from manufacturing come from a wide range of building materials like plastics, steel, glass, and aluminum. But today, we're going to zoom in on one of the most polluting materials in the manufacturing world, which is also one of the least mentioned materials in terms of emissions, cement. We build a lot of stuff. And a lot of that stuff, from the Three Gorges Dam to the Sydney Opera House, is built with concrete, which is a mixture of sand or gravel and a cement paste. Globally, we produce 4.1 billion tons of cement every single year. The US alone creates roughly 96 million metric tons, and China develops over half of the world's cement at 2.2 billion tons per year. We use so much of it because, to be quite honest, it's the perfect building material. Concrete is extremely durable, versatile, inflammable, and weatherproof. But concrete also has a large downside. In order to create cement and ultimately concrete, you also have to emit a lot of carbon dioxide. In fact, for every ton of cement made, a ton of carbon dioxide is released into the air. This happens because of a particular chemical reaction that occurs when raw materials are turned into finished cement. After raw limestone and clay have been ground up and mixed with other materials like ash, they are fed through a massive cylindrical kiln that gets heated up to 1450 degrees Celsius. Within these large kilns, a process called calcination occurs, wherein raw materials are split into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, and the final product becomes solid gray balls known as clinker. The byproduct of conventional cement, then, is carbon dioxide. CO2 emissions from the chemical process account for 50% of cement's total footprint. Another 40% of cement's emissions come from the burning of fossil fuels to heat the kiln up to extreme temperatures, and the final 10% comes from mining and transporting raw materials. In short, 90% of the CO2 emissions from cement come from what happens in and around that big- I just want to point out, these, these are cool, like when- when I'm sorry, like when they show this graphic of like, oh yeah, like that looks like you know, kind of like a like maybe maybe like you could make a make a tube that 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 large with like your arms or something like that. You're like, yeah, that yeah, no. 
And then you, uh, then you, like, go up, uh, and look at these, this picture, you're like, oh, wait, actually, no, the, these are literally the size of, like, buildings on their side. CO2 emissions from cement come from what happens in and around that big cylindrical kiln. As a result of these emissions, the cement industry generates 2.8 billion metric tons of CO2 every year. That's 8% of the total global CO2 emissions. This Literally 8%, almost 10% of what's killing the planet comes just from concrete. 10% of what's killing, like if we, if we could switch to something else that isn't putting CO2 into the atmosphere, you could just eliminate like 10% of uh, CO2. Like that, that'd be incredible. This means that if left unchecked, the growing cement industry could prove a huge obstacle to getting to You'll zero emissions by 2050. It also means that cement offers a chance to drastically reduce global emissions quickly if done right. When it comes oh, no. to greening no. the cement industry, there are a lot of proposed solutions. From geopolymers that harden at room temperature to using bacteria to grow concrete blocks, innovators are all scrambling to find the next alternative cement. One of them, a 2013 startup called Solidia, represents an exciting development in the world of cement. The company has developed an alternative chemical process for cement, which reduces both may, energy use can. and emissions by 30% during the manufacturing. We're going to, phase. Don't worry. But the most promising part about Solidia's cement is that they use carbon dioxide instead of water in order to harden their concrete blocks. This means that not only does Solidia cement conserve fresh water, which for an industry that God damn it. <laughs> Sorry. It accounts for 9% of total global industrial water use is huge, but it also means that Solidia's concrete blocks can sequester carbon. As a result of the decreased energy demands, reduction in emissions in the kiln process, and absorption of carbon during curing, Solidia claims they can reduce cement's carbon footprint by 70%. Meanwhile, in Silicon Valley, a startup- That's so cool! Guys, what's what's 70% of 10%? You know, like what what's 70% of uh, eight, I guess, like, I'm bad at math. <laughs> yeah, we could we could reduce just by using a different method of making cement. We could reduce emissions by like 5% total. Up called Blue Planet. Shut up, Entrema. It is approaching the cement problem from a different angle. They've developed a technology to create synthetic limestone aggregates, which are basically just rocks, by capturing carbon emissions from flue gas. This synthetic aggregate can then be used to replace the traditional materials like sand and gravel in the final concrete mix. Blue Planet claims this low-cost carbon sequestration method could theoretically offset all of the emissions from the cement creation process. In essence, the amount of carbon that Blue Planet's synthetic limestone captures could potentially equal the amount of carbon the cement production process creates. I'm a good streamer. These solutions, however, aren't without barriers. Solidia's cement curing process can only happen at a factory, which means its applications are limited compared to conventional cement. Blue Planet's aggregate process only comes in after the cement has gone through the kiln, meaning that its carbon capture properties are really just trying to make up for the emissions created during the kiln process. On top of that, both these companies have yet to really hit the market and be proven at scale. These alternatives have a long way to go, in part because they're entering an industry where safety and durability are king. So in the eyes of builders and safety inspectors, the tried and true conventional cement almost always also, trumps spooky, new varieties and bitties. inventions. Which means that without significant government backing and policy change, the concrete industry will stay rigid. But we should not just wait for new technologies to hopefully save us one day. The way we build... It's it's true, guys. This is how it works. I give you more attention the more money you give me. True. And how much we build can also greatly influence how much cement we use. 
According to a research paper by Chatham House, designing cities based on a capillary web system Thank could decrease car videos. use by two-thirds and cement demand by one-third. If employed in places like China and India where construction is booming, this type of smart design could mean huge reductions in concrete and, ultimately, emissions. At the end of the day, developing new technologies is just one part of our global concrete problem. Only combined with government policy, smart design, and reducing consumption can we truly create the building blocks of a zero-carbon world. True! And reducing consumption What's this? What's this about cross-laminated timber? Cross-laminated timber, or CLT, is an engineered timber product that is threatening to upset the dominant. Entrema, thank you for the 87 biddies. Y'all, y'all coming at me with two dollars. Thank you very much. So the big two structural materials, concrete and steel. Initially driven by the material sustainable credentials, cross-laminated timber buildings are gaining traction, as they can be quicker cheaper, cleaner, and quieter to build than traditional structures. Over the past five years, the use of CLT... This is actually aesthetically pleasing to me. CLT in construction has risen dramatically. The material has now been used to construct impressive and sustainable homes, offices, schools, and towers. Often referred to as super plywood, the material is constructed in a controlled factory environment from sustainably sourced timber. CLT is manufactured from spruce, although Scots pine, larch and Douglas fir can also be used. Once at the factory, the timber is planed and then kiln dried to reduce moisture content. The conditioned timber is then stacked into layers known as lamellas on top of one another. Each layer is placed at a 90 degree angle to the one beneath. These layers are then glued using a non-toxic adhesive and hydraulically pressed together to create the high strength structural panels. Individual panels can in theory be any size. However, their width is limited by the size of the manufacturing machinery, which is usually around 11 feet or 3.5 meters wide. The length of the panel is only dictated by how it will be transported cool. to site. While 45 feet or 13.5 meter lengths are typical for practical purposes, panels of up to 75 feet or 22 meters have been produced. Using state-of-the-art computer numerically controlled or CNC joinery machines, almost any shape of panel can be produced, meaning that door and window openings can be pre-cut in the factory. These off-site manufactured panels are then ready to be delivered to site. Fabrication is currently limited to only a handful of factories in mainly alpine countries, such as Stara Enzo's in Austria. While this may require the panels to be transported to site by road, the embodied energy added to the project is far outweighed by the carbon savings. Proponents of CLT claim that producing timber building components consumes only 50% of the energy required to produce concrete and a mere 1% of that needed to produce steel. Wait, so you can build a building without steel? You can just use this CLT? Prefabricated panels can be delivered to site as they're needed, making this construction method ideal for schemes with limited on-site storage capacity. They are then lifted into place using pre-installed lifting straps and rapidly assembled, greatly reducing construction time and therefore cost. As the timber used is kiln dried, CLT should not shrink or warp when on site. However, like most timber elements, CLT must be placed above the damp proof level and will need protection when used on the external facade. CLT construction can also reduce the self weight of a structure compared to concrete potentially reducing groundwork costs. The construction process is also cleaner than traditional methods, with greatly reduced levels of dust. It is also quieter, a distinct advantage for projects built in urban areas. Interesting. While there are numerous benefits to CLT, some people are fearful of living or working in timber buildings. Some believe these structures have an inherent fire risk, particularly when rising to 10, 20 or 30 storeys tall. Unlike unprotected steel, 
CRT can remain structurally stable when subjected to high temperatures. What? When exposed to fire, the outer layer of timber chars and forms a layer around the structural core, which can retain its low bed capacity. Oh, base. CLT's inherent fire resistance allows it to comply with fire resistance classes, withstanding oh. blazes for between 30 and 120 minutes, depending on its engineering and formation. CLT uptake and use was initially driven by the material's sustainable credentials. However, in recent times, a resurgent construction market that is placing pressure on traditional material. Honestly, I think I think what this is getting at is that timber, and I might be wrong about this, so don't quote me, but I think that wood actually has a pretty good amount of fire resistance in it. Um, and by having this many layers of wood on top of it on, on top of each other, um, it protects the inside and maintains its integrity. along with increased awareness, has bolstered adoption. While early CLT buildings were predominantly small, low-rise structures, the material is increasingly being considered for taller schemes. Since architect Wolf Fisselton built the first timber skyscraper, or ply scraper, in Man, these look cool! I want to live in one of these! These look way better than the, the condos that get built around uh, my area. 2009, tall timber buildings have been planned around the world. In the past five years, towers of 30 meters, constructed from CLT, have risen in Australia, America, and Europe. If you enjoyed this video, the alternative to asphalt uh, public loser is uh, solar roadways. Spooky! Thank you for subscribing and thank you for being part of the community for six months. I can't believe I've known you in chat for six months. Hmm. Let's see. There's also another video that I wanted to watch specifically about this. Here we go. This tower in Norway, this proposed skyscraper in Australia, and this school in the UK all have the same thing in common. They're all being built with timber taken from sustainably managed forests. You see, I was one step ahead of you, Entroma. And engineered in a factory like this. It's oh, and Public Loser. Yes, because solar road rays have been uh, getting field tested for the past like five years. Material we've built with for thousands of years, but after some major fires and then the advent of steel and concrete, the industrial- Actually, they're, the, they're installing solar roadway panels on aircraft carriers now to uh, give aircraft carriers more sustainable power and uh, test it with the load of like jets and such. Revolution and the birth of skyscrapers, it fell from favor and was rarely seen outside of house building. But that's all changing. The old problems of strength, fire, and deforestation are all being answered. The old excuses for not using it have fallen apart, and our planet stands on the edge. Yeah, like, here's the thing I'm not convinced that solar roadways, like, on a small scale, would be very good. But I think on a built on an incredibly large scale, such as the scale of our interstate highway system, I think the benefits would be incredible. You know, like being able to uh, filter uh, water, being able to uh, light up roads and have like kind of a smart system built into our roadways and having um, that a smart system that operates lights at night would be really helpful, I think, for a lot of drivers. And uh, I also think that... Um, having this system in place would largely be a way to interconnect our power grids in such a manner that like people would never lose energy like lose electricity again my big thing is that we need fewer parking lots but where we do they should all be covered with by solar canopies win-win with solar ev engineering and it makes parking lots less of an awful land use see i ag so i agree because like a, a solar canopy canopy would be more useful the advantage of like solar roadways is that they're more durable than asphalt because with asphalt you have to like basically rebuild the parking lot every 
uh, X number of years. Whereas the solar pa- the solar roads are like I think somewhere in the ballpark of like ten times more durable. Uh, so you have to replace them less. <laughs> no, you didn't tell me about that. Yeah, Entrema, the, the idea being that each uh, solar roadway panel would have to be replaced only once, like, every 25 years. As opposed to, like, our current road construction, which potholes, like, every year. <laughs> And the plus side is you could mass produce said panels so that you would always have enough and replacing them wouldn't be that much of an issue. The edge of a climate catastrophe, partly brought about by our reliance on unsustainable construction materials. It's time to change this. It's time we built every building. Yeah, and like... And Trima, that might be a good idea, and it might make it worth it might make it like worthwhile to just like keep it as a solar roadway just for like durability purposes and lighting purposes. Um, even if it's not generating electricity in that immediate area. What are you doing in here? Shoo! Shoo! Yeah, I had to shoo Samus away. There's not a spot for her to lay down right now. Hmm. With timber. So you're probably freaking out about now. We've just said that every building should be timber and advocated chopping Feminist non-conforming, as I said before, on small scales I agree with you, but I think the benefits outweigh the negatives on a large scale. Down trees to make buildings that are flammable, right? Well, on the trees and fire part, wrong. To really understand this material and why it's exactly what we need right now, you need to understand how it's made and used in a short but comprehensive video. Here we go. First off, wood comes from trees, and only when it's been made into planks, beams, or some kind of structural element is it then known as timber. Any reputable timber construction company will now get its wood from a sustainably managed forest. This is where more trees are planted than harvested, a practice now widespread across our planet and especially in Europe. We don't endorse anyone getting their timber from a forest that's not managed like this and neither do solid timber specialists like Urban. Sustainability is a really important thing for us in the timber industry because we are relying on the resource. If we cut all the forest down now and not replanting it, we don't have any work in a few years' time or the next generation will not have the joy using the forest as, as a leisure part of their life but also for building materials. As well as making sure we don't run out of trees, it's also a key weapon in our fight against the changing climate, as trees are able to absorb carbon dioxide and store it inside their wood. Our buildings account for about 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions, and constructing them in timber would help to reduce this figure. In fact, carbon emission savings of around 60% can be achieved, and 400% more carbon can be stored within a timber building than a concrete one. You have to remember that the processes for producing concrete and steel are highly unsustainable and do significant harm to our planet. Growing and harvesting timber this way is actually beneficial and the benefits would only grow if we built with it on a mass scale. Also, as trees age, they begin to absorb less CO2 and produce less oxygen. Therefore, harvesting them once they're mature and planting new ones in their place can, in some areas, actually be better for the environment than doing nothing. The other thing to point out is that the trees aren't cut down by a burly chap like this who's probably called Jack or Chip. I feel called out. 
They're carefully selected and increasingly felled by machines. Once cut, the wood is transported for processing, often in a location close to its source. Preparing raw timber for construction used to be a time-consuming manual task, just ask Chip, but today it's mostly done by machines in automated factories. Parts can be made quickly in almost any size or shape for any project. Large elements like walls, floors and even whole sections of a building can be made in factory control conditions before being transported to site. Once there, they're assembled on pre-built concrete foundations. It's quieter, faster and safer than other building techniques. We're not just using timber planks which are coming out of the forest and just sawn. Mass timber and engineered timber in general is a great innovation we have seen over the last few years. This allows us to build higher, bigger and in better quality than ever before. Modern wood types like cross-laminated timber known as CLT and laminated veneer lumber or LVL enable whole buildings to be made out of wood from the structural beams to the walls. CLT panels are made by fixing several lumber boards together in alternating layers using super strong adhesive and compression techniques. Doing this gives the material high strength in two directions, making it sturdy and versatile. Another kind of engineered wood known as glue laminated timber or glue lam is made using a similar method except the layers all face the same way. Glue lam's therefore ideal when strength is only needed in one direction, like with a column or a beam. Due to its light weight, mass timber can be engineered to be stronger than steel pound for pound, and because of its added seismic resistance, CLT performs impressively in areas prone to earthquakes. Heights also no longer the issue it once was, and timber buildings over 80 meters are already completed or under construction in Europe, North America, and Australia. Though still dwarfed by some of our biggest steel and concrete skyscrapers, growing expertise, improved R&D, pressure to build sustainably and the easing of height restrictions is quickly changing this. Whole timber districts are now appearing in several cities. We can achieve the spans needed to build airports, train stations and bridges. The proven well-being benefits are making a difference in timber schools and hospitals and one football club in the UK has gained approval for the world's first all-timber stadium. We are pushing boundaries here. We see all kinds of new buildings, bigger buildings, really special buildings happening in timber. And that's the great thing. We have sparked the imagination of designers. While that may be so, the prospect of building every building with timber can instinctively raise concerns, especially when it comes to fire. Now, all buildings carry the risk of fire, but timber buildings can be made to burn in a much more predictable way than those built from steel and concrete, and can be designed to be even safer. Engineers can now design timber buildings to burn for specific periods of time. They remain standing for long enough to meet the regulation escape times, normally an hour or more. Traditionally, we knew very little about timber and therefore our designs were super conservative. So we were using huge safety factors because we knew little about timber and we were not optimizing our designs. Carmen Gorska is a research and development fire safety engineer at renewable materials company Stora Enzo. It's about the quality of the design and the design should just take into account how each material is going to behave when there is a fire. So steel is going to bend much more than timber. Timber is going to, to burn and char, and concrete is going to spall, for example. So it's just about understanding with uh, mat what material we are dealing with. Timber structures can be fitted with sacrificial layers where an outer section takes the brunt of the damage and chars at a predictable rate in the event of a fire. Softwoods like the ones used here can char at a rate of less than one millimetre a minute, protecting the inner segments and allowing time for evacuation. Today the most current practice is to protect timber with uh, plasterboard sheets. So normally we know how long the fire is going to take and we just uh, adjust the amount of layers and the thickness of plasterboard layers that are going to protect the wall behind from, from the whole duration of the fire. Timber buildings can be designed for self-extinguishment too, which is when flames are no longer strong enough to break down the material and the fire dies out due to a lack of fuel. The modern timber used in many large-scale buildings like apartment blocks and that proposed stadium is also treated with fire retardants which prevent the spread of flames on the material surface. 
Moisture and the threat of mould is another issue that Mass Timber has tackled. Although water can't be entirely removed, CLT is kiln dried to bring moisture content down to around 12%, enough to prevent fungal attack and kill off any bugs that might be lurking inside. If all of these benefits weren't enough, timber also looks pretty awesome, and architects are creating some incredible buildings, especially by leaving the fire-treated material exposed. Of course, building with timber can't eradicate our use of other materials. We still need concrete foundations, and some buildings are often hybrids of timber and steel, but it would make a massive difference to the process of construction. Things would be quicker and quieter, the end result would be better for our mental health and well-being, and we'd be generating far less pollution along the way. The mass timber industry is seriously scaling up at exactly the same time as our need to build more buildings, quickly, in a higher quality way that doesn't harm the planet. Yay. The benefits are pretty hard to ignore, and going all out with wood is becoming a no-brainer for many construction companies and their customers around the world. It's no longer a question of why would you build with timber, but why wouldn't you? We have the ability and the business case to build all of our buildings like this. The examples and the potential is all there, and an entire generation of muscular lumberjacks could be understood and appreciated for the brains it took to craft this advanced process, not just their brawn. If you liked this video and you want to learn more about where construction is headed, make sure you subscribe to Tomorrow's Ashmar. Build. We are... Hello, Reddit Travis. We're having a chill time. I made everyone doomer for a little bit, and now I'm pulling you all back in to the taking the hope pill. It's being a real good time. We're having we're having good times, and we're gonna make fun of conservatives eventually. It's gonna be it's gonna be a, a great a great guffaw for all um and i am playing with your emotions this is true <clears throat> all right public loser i shall entertain you like the knave i am Can I ask how you arrived at the conclusion that solar roadways are a reasonable idea? Uh, well, I think an interconnected energy grid is a good idea, and I think um, built-in heating for roads is a good idea, uh, as somebody who lives in a particularly snowy region. Um, I think that uh, inefficiency, but on a large scale, is acceptable. Um, what else? And I think that being able to cl uh, like clean pollutants out of uh, rainwater, wastewater, would be a useful thing to be able to do. <laughs> Spooky. So yeah, I think all of those things would be pretty, uh, pretty useful and based. But we're not done with our environmental arc today, people. Uh, perhaps you could have a thermovoltaic strip in the part of the road where the cars drive and photovoltaic sections uh, along the middle and side where the, there's more in uninterrupted sunlight. That could be good. Yeah. Uh, currently, I believe the solar roadways project is do it has like a major... Um, like grant with the Department of Defense, they're they're going to be using the uh, panels on military bases, um, and I guess we'll we'll see how that goes. If it doesn't work out, doesn't work out. We can move on to a different idea, but uh, I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful it could turn into something cool. Um, and yeah, maybe maybe like a thermovoltaic strip could work. Um. Yeah, I mean that—that's the thing, feminist nonconforming. That—that's the—that's kind of the entire point of like iterating on an idea and improving it over time and testing it out. 
uh, you improve the product to try and get it to a more usable level. Um, and I think if we hit a point where solar roadways are a viable option, then they offer a lot of really intriguing benefits. Well, the uh, Entrema, the, the the solar roadways have like the ability to run like fiber cable through them, as well as uh, like energy. So the idea being that instead of needing to rely on like telephone wires, uh, you could just use solar roadways instead. The 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 wires could literally be built into the infrastructure, or the connections rather. Um. I don't know. These are like these are things that have been considered already. Talking about transmission efficiency loss. Well, yeah, but that that's already a thing that happens now. In in traditional wires that connect our country's electricity grid. Um Let's see. Oh, that's right. If you do that, you'll take out the power every time you replace a section. Well, it's not like, well, A, most places aren't connected by just one road to the surrounding area. And B, um, the roads are multiple segments long like it takes multiple panels next to each other to make a full road so taking out one panel that gets knocked out wouldn't take off the electrical grid oh i get what you mean entrema yeah um but building off of this conversation about uh solar energy uh, we have, uh, we, we talked about MIT earlier, and now we're going to talk about MIT again. A few lonely academics have been warning for years that solar power faces a fundamental challenge that could halt the industry's breakneck growth. Simply put, the more solar you add to the grid, the less valuable it becomes. The problem is that solar panels generate lots of electricity in the middle of sunny days, frequently more than is required driving down prices, sometimes into the negative territory. Unlike a natural gas plant, solar plant operators can't easily throttle electricity up or down as needed, or space generation out through the day, night, and dark winter. It's available when it's available, which is when the sun is shining. Lower prices, prices may sound great for consumers, but it presents troubling implications for the world's, own, the world's hopes of rapidly expanding solar capacity and meeting climate goals. Meaning solar is too cheap and the profit motive for building it diminishes because it gets so cheap at inconvenient times. Uh, feminist nonconforming, why not use both? Why not, why not do rooftop solar and, if possible, do solar roadways? We're, we're facing a climate catastrophe. One of these solutions by itself is not going to solve all our problems. <sighs> limited resources. I mean, if we have lim look, if the problem is limited resources, then why the fuck are we wasting time with uh, solar? Let's, we should just be going full on on nuclear energy. Way more uh, resource... Uh, conservation going on with nuclear energy. Oh, good night, Chaotic Kitten. Like, like, if the problem is, well, we can only do one thing because of a lack of resources, then that one thing should be nuclear energy. Oh, well, feminist nonconforming. There we go. Then the problem is, we, we can't do, we can't do rooftop solar. It's impossible. We have to do nuclear. Or we could just do any and everything that we can to avoid a uh, climate disaster.
Let's skip to building a Dyson sphere. Solar panels on my pussy. Wait, Spooky, how often is your pussy exposed to the sunlight? <laughs> Let's see. So the lurking threat to solar power's growth. A new report finds that California, which produces one of the largest shares of solar power in the world, is already acutely experiencing this phenomenon known as solar value deflation. The state's average solar wholesale prices have fallen 37% relative to the average electricity prices for other sources since 2014, according to the Breakthrough Institute analysis. Uh, which will be published on July 14th. In other words, utilities are increasingly paying solar plants less than other sources overall due to their fluctuating generation patterns. Wholesale prices are basically the amount the utilities pay power plants for the electricity they deliver to households and businesses. They shift throughout the day and year, edging back up for solar operators during the mornings, afternoons, and other times when there isn't an excess supply. But as more solar plants come online, the periods of excess supply that drive down those costs will become more frequent and more pronounced. Lower prices may sound great for consumers, but it presents troubling implications for the world's hopes of rapidly expanding solar capacity and meeting climate goals. It could become difficult to convince developers and investors to continue building ever more solar plants if they stand to make less money or even lose it. This is, uh, by the way, one of the, um, when we were talking earlier about how uh, rapid industrialization and eternal growth was going to lead to economic and uh, societal collapse. This is this is like a perfect example of that. Like, well, well, guys, we we just can't we can't do solar. You see, doing solar makes it eliminates the profit motive for building solar plants and for building other kinds of electrical infrastructure. So we're just not gonna do it. We're just not gonna. We're not going to have solar power because it's not profitable. And like, I'm sorry. That's kind of the point. Yeah, that was always the point of solar. The point of solar was to have enough solar panels so that electricity was not like this issue that we had to worry about. Um, now, granted, that applies to a lot of different energies, but like, Th this 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 approach of like think of the companies is just like such a completely foreign idea when we're talking about the availability of energy like okay if it's not going to be profitable well then why do we have privatized like energy producing in the united states anyway like if you're going to complain about that it's not profitable let's have the state do it uh, give up this pretense of uh energy being this kind of like free market thing guys that you can profit off of and just have the government step in and run it at a loss <sighs> goodness Let's see. Researchers at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory highlighted similarly uh, declining solar values in California in a broader study published in Juul last month. But they noted that numerous modeling studies have shown that the additional the addition of low cost storage options, including so-called hybrid plants coupled with lithium ion batteries, eases value deflation and enables larger shares of renewables to operate economically on the grid. Uh, there are likely limits to this, however, as study after study finds that storage and system costs rise sharply once renewables provide the vast majority of electricity on the grid. 
so <laughs> essentially this is uh from mit's uh technology review um and they're basically just arguing that it's too ex it, it's too inexpensive uh to run solar and renewables and simultaneously it like boosts the cost of storing said renewable energies so it becomes less economically feasible for private entities to undertake like that kind of business in which case great let's do away with this entire farce of uh you know energy companies competing with one another So, and that brings us to another part of this problem, right? Because I don't think solar's making things too cheap is like a great rationale for not doing these things. But I do think that you can come up with other uh, criticisms when it comes to like solar and renewables, right? So, or, but competition, good. Yeah, right, right, Erged. Um, so one of the things that is a major stumbling block when it comes to uh, like green energy um, is the fact that we don't have really great energy storage solutions. Like we have like a limited ability to store energy, but the vast majority of energy that we create just kind of like dissipates into the, the ether, you know, like if it's not used, it's gone, baby. Um, pumped storage hydroelectricity Geronimus Prime exactly one of the things that I've kind of become a little obsessed with is the idea of gravity batteries uh, which are scalable solutions to energy storage that you can build pretty much anywhere um, <laughs> basically uh, the the traditional method of like storing energy is kind of like uh, pumping water up into a giant reservoir and then when energy is needed allowing water to flow back down into a secondary reservoir etc um but that is largely something that is limited when it comes to geography you can't uh you could theoretically i suppose build these reservoirs in uh different areas but also it kind of also means you can't use that water which as water becomes a more precious resource is going to be more difficult to uh, justify. However, there are other ways we can store uh, power with gravity, and uh, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. So, gravity gravity energy energy storage will show its true potential in 2021. Uh, so there are multi there are numerous companies that are trying to get this technology into a um, really interesting state. So, for example, there's uh, Energy Vault. And Energy Vault is essentially being like, yo, we know how to build cranes, so we're going to put cranes on top of our cranes on top of our cranes on top of our cranes. And basically, they just have these giant, like, multi-armed cranes. And in order to store energy, they, uh, they lift up giant, uh, like, five-ton uh, blocks. Wait, how, how heavy are they? Let's see. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, 35 metric ton blo blocks. Um, so they each of these like holds up a giant crane. And then as energy is needed, they release the crane, um, which uh, releases the energy. Um, so that is one option. There's also... Uh, a simpler version in Scotland called Gravitricity. Now, Gravitricity is kind of interesting because it's essentially uh, providing a way that we can reuse mines that have been abandoned across the world, right? So you find abandoned mine shafts, and Gravitricity's approach is essentially throwing a giant, a giant weight into uh, the mine. And uh, in order to store power, you just move the weight up and then you like slowly uh, move the weight down again. Um, let's see, how heavy is this? Yeah, here we go. How heavy 
Yeah, they're called energy mines, which is pretty cool. Yeah, uh, so these giant weights are essentially 500 to 5,000 metric tons. Um, and essentially it's just storing power by hauling it up. And then they only need to like, to release like a significant amount of energy. They just need to uh, like release the weight by like a millimeter or a centimeter. <laughs> um, which is pretty gosh darn cool. But we have another another method which also uses water, but it's different from the reservoir method, like hydroelectric storage method. Uh, my brain is so big and wrinkly. Uh, goodness, I don't know. Uh, but essentially, they use water to power this colossal piston. Um, so you could call it piss power if you really wanted to. Um, <laughs> um, so the water is pumped underground and it causes this incredible weight to uh, rise. And let's see, how does this work? Instead of storing energy using reservoirs at different elevations, they pump water underground to lift an extremely heavy piston. Allowing the piston to fall pushes water through a turbine to generate electricity. Uh, let's see. Fisk estimates that a 400 megawatt plant with 16 hours of storage or 6.4 gigawatt hours of, of energy would have a piston that's more than 8 million metric tons. That might sound ludicrous, but it's well within the lifting abilities of today's pumps and the constraints of construction processes, he says. So, like, we have these cool energy, like, solutions for storing electricity that we could apply to uh, renewables in a way that, like, is super interesting. But we can't have fat water. That's a lot of brain. Why are you guys talking about my brain being all wrinkled? Exactly, Entrema. The bottom line is when people tell you that we don't have solutions to these problems, we do. We just need to invest in those solutions. We need to exert the political will to pursue these solutions because they're out there. Even if like even if we don't have like the next generation of salt battery or whatever, even if we don't have the next generation of uh, battery that can store like an entire uh, like East Coast worth of energy, you know, like even if we don't have a Gen 4 nuclear reactor, we have all the tools at our disposal that we need with current technology to save our planet. We just need to choose to do it. We need to choose our priority. We need to prioritize a sustainable world in order to avert our own uh, catastrophized future. I lick the salt battery. No, Spooky, no. OMG, I got a great idea. Something tells me I'm going to hate this idea. Take all the excess ocean water from sea level rise. <laughs> and make salt batteries. Well, Entrema, that's that's literally what I advocate for. I think we should be using we should be using like uh, nuclear desalination plants to cool our nuclear power plants and also to make clean drinking water, and also to make salt for giant salt batteries that we can then use to store the nuclear power. It'd be great. <sighs> hey, Moro. Hello, Prince Seal, my favorite eldritch cowboy. Or cow, cow them? Sounds like a climate change solving uh, Swiss army knife. Well, that yeah, that's kind of the idea. Well, like, but here's the thing, Entrema. It's not a pipe dream. We have the ability to do all those things, you know? Like, goodness. Seems like a lot of science slash tech bros just want some magic clean energy sort so they can keep doing the things the way they've always been. Yeah. And that's the thing. We, we have the science. We have the means. And we don't need to live in this world where, like, science will come up with a way to save us. No, science has come up with a way to save us. 
We have all the tools we need. Let's just use them. 